Liquid water really helps define the habitable zone. If it's too hot, again, the water just boils away. You just can't get condensed water. It's too cold, as in Mars today, it freezes out. Within our solar system, the habitable zone is relatively narrow, beginning well outside the orbit of Venus and ending short of the orbit of Mars. If the Earth were just 5% closer to the Sun, it would be subject to the same fate as Venus, a runaway greenhouse effect with temperatures rising to nearly 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Conversely, if the Earth were 20% farther from its home star, carbon dioxide clouds would form in its upper atmosphere, initiating the cycle of ice and cold that has sterilized Mars. The presence of liquid water is a necessary condition for life, but it's not a sufficient condition. After all, there may be liquid water under the frozen surfaces of Mars and Jupiter's moon Europa, but there's very little chance that complex life exists in either of these places. You see, contrary to what the Copernican principle might suggest, the recipe for life is much more complex than just add water. If a recipe for a planet capable of supporting complex life really did exist, then what ingredients beyond liquid water might be required? The list of necessary factors continues to grow. We live on this paper-thin crust. If the Earth's crust were significantly thicker, then plate tectonic recycling could not take place. The Earth's crust varies in thickness from about 4 to 30 miles. It consists of more than a dozen tectonic plates that are in constant motion. This dynamic geology regulates the planet's interior temperature, recycles carbon, mixes chemical elements essential to living organisms, and shapes the continents. Deep within the Earth's interior, the movement of liquid iron generates a protective magnetic field essential to complex life. If our planet was smaller, its magnetic field would be weaker, allowing the solar wind to strip away our atmosphere, slowly transforming the Earth into a dead, barren world much like Mars. We need an oxygen atmosphere and the oxygen-nitrogen um, atmosphere that the Earth has is necessary for complex life. As seen from space, the Earth's atmosphere glows as a thin blue ribbon of light. Measuring less than 1% of the planet's diameter, it is composed of a mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. As a result, our atmosphere ensures a temperate climate, protection from the sun's radiation, and the correct combination of gases necessary for liquid water and complex life. For a size of a planet like Earth, our moon is big. The current thinking is that if our moon didn't exist, neither would we. One-fourth the size of the Earth, the moon's powerful gravitational pull stabilizes the angle of its axis at a nearly constant 23 and a half degrees. This ensures relatively temperate seasonal changes and the only climate in the solar system mild enough to sustain complex living organisms. If we find life out there, especially complex or even intelligent life, it will be around a star similar to our own. We orbit what is known as a spectral type G2 dwarf main sequence star. It is well suited for our needs. If the Sun were less massive, like 90% of the stars in the galaxy, the habitable zone would be smaller. To remain within its boundaries, the Earth would have to be positioned closer to its star. Here, increased gravity would lock our planet's rotation into synchronization with its orbit. While one side of the Earth continually faced the Sun and increased radiation from solar flares, the dark side of the planet 
would lay shrouded in perpetual cold and ice. It is unlikely complex life could tolerate these drastic extremes in temperature. A lot of things went right on Earth to have uh, yielded complex life, absolutely. The number of factors that have been postulated um, has grown. Currently, the typical number you would see is, in a typical list, would have something like 20. We find that we need to be at the right location in the galaxy, that we're inside the circumstellar habitable zone of a star, that we're in a planetary system with giant planets that can shield the inner planets from too many comet impacts, that we're orbiting the right kind of star that's not too cool or not too hot, that we're on a planet that has a moon that can stabilize the tilt of its axis, that we're on a planet that's a terrestrial planet, a planet that has a crust that's just thick enough that it can maintain plate tectonic activity, but it has enough heat in its interior that it's still circulating its liquid iron core so it can generate a magnetic field, that it has an atmosphere that has enough oxygen to allow for complex organisms to survive, that it has enough water and enough continents to allow for the diversity of life or an active biosphere that we need to support complex creatures such as ourselves. All these factors have to be met at one place and time in the galaxy if you're going to have a planet as habitable as the Earth, which you need for complex and even technological life. In an attempt to estimate the probability of attaining this combination of factors simultaneously, some researchers have developed equations assigning a conservative 1 in 10 value to each factor deemed necessary for advanced life. If every element has to be there at the same time, you have to multiply the probabilities. And that's what makes the probability at the end so small. You've got 10% of this and 10% of that, and these things rapidly multiply to exceedingly small numbers. The numbers on the order of 10 to minus 15, which is 1 1,000th of 1 1 trillion. And it's a number like that that you have to compare to the 100 billion stars that are in the galaxy. 100 billion is a very large number, but a thousandth of a trillion is much, much smaller. On their face value, these probabilities are speaking. What they're telling us is this can't happen, or this is very unlikely to happen in the galaxy. And that's where the evidence is pushing us. There are many probabilistic resources in the galaxy, but on the other side of the coin, are all these factors that you need. You have to get just right in order to have just one habitable planet like the Earth. And that leads me to conclude that yes, we're rare in the galaxy. While a growing body of scientific evidence may support this hypothesis, does the possibility that our planet is rare within the galaxy imply anything about its significance? Recently, astronomer Donald Brownlee considered this question in the best-selling book, Rare Earth, Why Complex Life is Uncommon in the Universe. There's a general feeling that uh, the nature wants to make Earth-like planets and that naturally the life will evolve on them and naturally evolve to something like, like us. And yet the conditions, the environmental conditions on a planet that would allow more complex creatures, similar to people, or plants and animals, is very rare. And so we wrote the book Rare Earth uh, to point out that the Earth is actually a rather special place. Brownlee contends that while relatively simple microbial life may thrive on planets throughout the universe, planets capable of sustaining complex life are exceedingly uncommon. Well, the entire universe is highly hostile to life. If you compare all the known places in, in the universe, none of them compare to Earth. We live in a very special environment that provides what we need, provides air, provides food, stable conditions, so that the Earth is almost like a giant organism where its systems are interacting in a way that allows animals to survive. But the real question is, you know, why did, why did this happen? Was it just a matter of luck or not? If you look at thousands of planets, only a small fraction of them, a very small fraction, will be truly Earth-like. So if we are very rare, we did win the, the cosmic lottery. So we're lucky plan. We're just in a very fortunate place.